Good morning, everyone. I'm going to welcome you back from our break. I'll introduce our next speaker as we're all gathering. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Watts Pope, and I'm a board member of the Ephemeris Society. I'm also the curator of books and digitized collections at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker. Hannah Swan is the archivist for the School of Pharmacy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison currently working on an NEH grant-funded project to process ephemera held by the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Previously, she received a postgraduate degree. There's some, a lot of good degrees in this um, introduction. <laughs> she also received a postgraduate degree in archives and records management from the University College of London, a master's in book history and material culture from the University of Edinburgh, and she worked as a reference assistant at the Phillips Library at, of the Peabody Essex Museum. She is also the 2022 recipient of the Anthony Davis Book Collecting Prize for her personal collection of mid-century party planning books and ephemera, a collection I think uh, most of us would love to see at some point. Uh, right now, though, she's going to speak to us about another fascinating subject, uh, the title of her presentation, Come On In, The Water's Curative, A Brief History of Healing Springs and Medical Tourism. Okay. All right. Uh, so hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as she said, the, the title has changed maybe just a little bit, but come on in, the water's fine. A brief history of healing spas and medical tourism. Uh, my name's Hannah Swan, and I'm the archivist for the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Pharmacy, where I manage the collections of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. So before we begin, Uh, I just want to take a moment to introduce the collections of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy, or AIHP, uh, from which almost all of the items you'll see today come. The collection totals about 1,500 linear feet of materials, most of which are ephemera documenting the history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals from the 19th century through to the 21st century. The collection spans topics ranging from psychedelic medicine to retail pharmacy design to uh, patent medicines, medicine shows, and general quackery. The AIHP also supports scholarship in the history of pharmacy through community outreach, programming, and grants and awards. So before we dive into the rest of the presentation, which I promise will be my first and last water-based pun, uh, I think it's important to contextualize the materials with a bit of background on early water cures. So as I mentioned, our collections at the AIHP don't generally go further back than the mid-19th century, meaning I didn't have any ephemera to directly illustrate ancient water cures or heroic medicine per se. Um, but we'll start over here on the left uh, in Bath, England, one of the most well-known water cure establishments in the world, for a whirlwind tour of about 10,000 years of bathing history in roughly two minutes. So there's no real beginning to the history of humanity's use of mineral springs, in so much as it's been going on since time immemorial and across cultures all on all continents, excepting perhaps Antarctica though I guess we'll have to ask Doug about that one. <laughs> uh, at Bath in England, the earliest use of the waters was roughly 10,000 years ago by Paleolithic hunters. Around the world, mineral springs were often considered sacred and were used by local communities as medicine, gathering space, and ritual purification. Both the Greeks and Romans esteemed bathing, though they differed in their approaches. The Greeks tended to view cold water as more curative, while the Romans leaned toward the benefits of soaking in hot water. The city of Bath, England, was founded in the first century CE by the Romans, who built the extravagant bathhouses within which they would take the waters. Though it's a bit strange to think of Romans going on holiday, scholars often point to Augustan Rome as the birth of modern tourism, centered on a change of air and including visiting mineral springs for health. And they even had travel guidebooks. Moving forward in time, during the Middle Ages, mineral springs remained popular with rich Europeans who were the few able to afford to travel to visit them. 
However, public bathhouses began to get a seamy reputation as hotspots for sex work and as such for sexually transmitted diseases. This eventually led to the almost total suppression of public baths in England by Henry VIII in the early 1500s, and that lasted until about the mid-17th century. And as an interesting side note, uh, the word stew was often used as a synonym for public bath, uh, which originally meant you were stewing in the hot water. Uh, but as things became increasingly uh, ill repute, uh, we can say that stew became a synonym for a brothel. So unfortunately, I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of this period from about 1400 to 1800, but what you mostly need to know is that personal bathing all but disappears in the West. So the general idea seems to have been that disease is coming in through your pores, so you need to keep this nice, healthy layer of grime to keep the diseases out. Instead, uh, bathing begins to emerge in what is known as heroic medicine. So heroic medicine is tied to the humors, the idea that you have four humors in your body that need to remain in balance for you to stay healthy. And these are black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. Treatment, involved around, uh, treatment revolved around the rebalancing of these humors through things like bloodletting, purging, and hot and cold bathing. And even up to the mid-19th century, many Americans didn't regularly bathe themselves, and when they did, often didn't get fully wet. So I've uh, reproduced here a 1902 ad for splendid money makers for hustling wide awake druggists to show that even in the early 20th century, there would still be a need for a folding water bath, which you could use, filled either by tap or by bucket, and then fold away when not needed. So moving right on through time, we will stop in the mid-19th century to discuss the birth of the American water cure and its connections to contemporary reform movements. All the images you see here were taken from a volume of the Water Cure Journal from 1855, which I consulted at the Ebling Library, which is the health services library at Madison, UW-Madison. In the early 19th century, an idea began to spread that maybe illness wasn't caused by, you know, coming in through your pores but, or your imbalance of humors, but rather was brought down on you as punishment for your moral transgressions. This is what was eventually called either hygienic religion or medical sectarianism. Moral and spiritual purists began to call for piety, temperance, sexual abstinence, and certain dietary restrictions, the idea being that le leading a pure and natural life would lead to spiritual and health perfection. As a whole, these ideas joined to be known as the reform movement. Beyond health, reformers also backed socio-political movements such as suffrage, temperance, uh, abolition, prison reform, and labor law reform. As you see here in the middle, uh, the, this include dress reform for women, uh, with supporters calling for rational dress, such as bloomers, uh, to be worn by women, and the eradication of corsets. It wasn't all progressive social movements, though, of course. As I'm sure many of you know, reformers also had deep ties to phrenology, which was connected to things like eugenics and ideas of racial purity. And in an interesting turn, the publishers of the Water Cure Journal were Fowler and Wells, who are probably the most well-known phrenologists of the period in New York. So for our purposes, the most important part of the reform movement was, of course, the water cure. So though sometimes attached to a mineral spring, it wasn't necessary for the administration of a water cure. The main requirement seems to have been a rural location where you can take your waters. This included drinking large amounts of water, so as many as 20 glasses per day, taking cold baths, various douches, which are both internal and external, cold water enemas, which were meant to tone your intestines, localized bandaging with wet compresses, and my personal favorite, being tightly wrapped in a cold, wet sheet, wrapped in wool blankets, left for several hours to eventually normalize your temperature and begin to sweat. And these cures were used to treat everything from paralysis to typhoid to excessive masturbation. And as the popularity of the water cure grew, the institutions began to cater less to reformers and more to holiday goers. And this comes in parallel with the growth of the American middle class and uh, the rapid increase of railroads that begin to connect the country. So, 
Now we're gonna get into the evolution of these water cure establishments in America during the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So this is where the collection really shines. Most of our materials on water cures date from about the 1880s to the 1940s. And it's also an interesting period for hydrotherapy as a whole. It moves from being this really intensive cure where you're sweating it out in your blankets uh, based around this ethos of reform towards something that is done mostly for purely pleasure and relaxation. So in other words, this is the moment when the water cure turns into the modern spa vacation. And we're gonna start in the US and then move to Euro European cures as the relationship between tourism is a bit different between the two. So uh, we will begin with Manitou Springs. So Manitou serves as a good starting point for us in our journey, as it represents many of the different elements that are common amongst these various spas uh, in the 19th century. The resort surrounding these springs was founded in the 1870s and established Manitou Springs as the first resort town in Colorado. So first and foremost, when we're talking about common themes, we should note that this is a site that was sacred, that had sacred meaning to the local indigenous peoples of the Western American Plains, particularly the Mountain Ute people. White settlers in the 19th century noted offerings left at the springs, which were used for healing by local communities and as a meeting place and place of rest for local tribes during the winter. As with many American resorts, the displacement of these local indigenous communities led to conflict over access to the sacred sites, which were unfortunately finally resolved by the American government's removal of local tribes to reservations. And you can see here on the right that they actually named three of the springs, Navajo, Manitou, and Shoshone, presumably to give them this kind of exotic, mystical air to potential customers. But it's worth noting that the Navajo or Diné people and Shoshone or Newe people were not the traditional stewards of the springs. The names are complete fabrications. And similarly, Manitou comes from an Algonquian word, which means spirit, that was used largely by Eastern American tribes to describe what they saw as the sacred spirit that animated the hot springs. So presumably, they're both evoking kind of the established water cures in the East, which, which often made mention of Manitou, and also lending this air of mysticism to their hot springs. So Manitou is also similar to many other water-based resorts in that the proprietors translated their success as a health resort into a partnered business, bottling the waters and selling them on the market. And we'll discuss that a little more later, but I just wanna note that, uh, as I mentioned previously, temperance advocates really uh, spoke to water as being this alternative to the evils of alcohol. And here you can see that we actually have this advertised as the finest sparkling table water and ginger champagne in the world. So obviously providing that direct comparison. So Manitou eventually became known as the Saratoga of the West, and we're gonna to touch on Saratoga Springs a bit later, but this idea of comparison takes us to our next slide and a discussion of cultural reference in advertising these resorts. So on the left here, we have this excellent cover uh, from a booklet advertising Carlsbad Mineral Water from the Carlsbad Springs in modern day Chechia, uh, lo known locally as Carlo Vivari. And Carlo Vivari was at the time one of the most famous spa towns in Europe, as evidenced by these two pieces of ephemera you see here on the right, uh, both of which claim their respective resort is the Carlsbad of America. So these resorts were being marketed to wealthy Americans, and we can see this evocation of Carlsbad as a kind of sophistication, implying that though they may be in Arkansas or South Dakota, they will be afforded all the beauty and luxury of a European spa retreat. And now we'll take a little closer look at these two imitation Carlsbads. Um, so many of you may have heard of Hot Springs, Arkansas, um, which is still famous for its hot springs today. Um, as is pretty much always the case, as I mentioned, the springs had been used by local indigenous communities for centuries before being identified by white settlers. The resort itself was built in the 1870s and 1880s, and in an interesting piece of trivia, Frederick Law Olmsted was actually intended to do the landscaping for the town, uh, but withdrew after some intense conflict over his contract. 
Uh, so returning to this idea of the Carlsbad of America, you can see here that we have, you know, these really, I'm gonna try to use my laser pointer, these really uh, wide, you know, European style boulevards for strolling, as well as this kind of European inspired architecture, uh, clearly mo meant to evoke the European spa town experience. Another interesting thing is the pricing here at the bottom. Uh, so they're giving us uh, this range for the weekly cost uh, to stay in the hot springs, um, which would have been about $42 to $145 in 1899. And it's always difficult to make these kind of direct comparisons as far as wages and how much does a dollar worth now versus 1899. But we can say that this would be about 1500 to $5,200 per week to stay in hot springs. So that's not insignificant and really, you know, means that this was not accessible to a large portion of the population. Another interesting thing to note here is under the as a pleasure resort heading, where they write that uh, the idea that it is only those who are afflicted who come here has long since proven erroneous. So already by 1899, we're seeing this movement away from the water cure as a me medical necessity and towards this all encompassing idea of a pleasure spa vacation with presumably some health benefits on the side. And finally, I want to draw your attention to the copyright page up here, um, where, which gives the agent information for the Iron Mountain Railroad and the Hot Springs Railroad. And this gives you a sense of the interconnectedness of the expanding rail network and these new resorts. Because many of the hot springs were in very rural and inaccessible locations, they relied heavily on these new transit links to bring uh, visitors to them. All right, so our second Carlsbad of America is Hot Springs, South Dakota. They got really creative with these names, as you can tell. Um, like Hot Springs, Arkansas, the resort town was constructed mostly in the 1870s and 1880s and was well established by the publication of this advertisement in the 1890s. So again, you know, we have this language and this imagery that really evokes this, you know, idea of the European spa vacation relocated into South Dakota. Um, we've got the Palace Resort Hotel of the West, which is so up to date as to be heated by steam and lighted by electricity. Um, I also like that they note that the fire hose and fire escapes are on every floor. Um, I'm sure the historians in the audience can affirm that everything seems to have been on fire from about 1870 to 1900, so this was probably a real necessity. Um, and again, we have you know, reduced rates by week or month. So that tells us that this is not somewhere that you're stopping into en route elsewhere, but really the destination in and of itself. So we're gonna jump about 50 years here. <laughs> again, this is somewhat bounded by the collection itself. Um, but we are going into arguably America's most famous resort town. So if you'll remember, Manitou Springs was advertising itself as the Saratoga of the West. And that's in reference to these famous springs. Although we've moved ahead about 50 years, uh, we should note that Saratoga Springs was actually one of the earliest water cure establishments in America, founded in 1802. Um, and they are the only naturally carbonated springs east of the Rockies. So like all American hot springs, they were, again, sacred to local indigenous groups long before being commercialized. Many of you probably know Saratoga Springs for its racetrack which also fits into the shifting identity of the water cure establishment during this period. The Saratoga Springs racetrack opened in 1863, which makes it the oldest racetrack in America, and was followed by a casino in 1870. And this is kind of central to this idea of integrating leisure with the kind of more medical spa experience. We're moving away again, from being left to shiver in our blankets to this more pleasure-based approach of relaxation, fresh air, and amusements. And that's not to say that, you know, health doesn't still play a part in attracting customers. Um, over here on the left, you know, you can see that we still have all these medical treatments that are on offer. You know, I think I can speak for most of us when I say that colon irrigation is not high on my vacation to-do list. Uh, so you do still have this kind of medical draw to the spa as well. So, I keep forgetting. 
Okay, so these are materials that were sent to the Institute um, by the spa. So not only do they de detail treatments, costs, and local medical staff, but they also detail um, over here some of the uh, primary conditions that were treated um, at the spa. And it's interesting uh, because basically most people are coming in for rheumatic ailments and uh, heart ailments, and that includes high blood pressure. So again, it suggests that although there's still this focus on the medical benefits, it's tending more towards the kind of aches and pains of everyday life rather than, say, trying to cure your typhoid. Um, we can think of you know, heart disorders as being something like high blood pressure that comes from stress, and rheumatic ailments could even be as mundane as you know, the kind of aches and pains of getting older. And so here's the kind of ultimate endpoint of the water cure. So we've moved all the way from the sometimes extreme water cures of the reform movement to the quote restoration cure, which is basically just getting away from it all, relaxing and being active. The booklet reads, primarily the re restoration cures for those who suffer from no organic disorder, whose health ordinarily is good, but who may have been under some unusual physical or nervous strain, or who may just feel run down. And so you can see over here that they're supposed to come to the restful natural beauty, gentle stimulation, you know, again, much more of a focus on relaxation than on uh, strict medical treatment. And I think, uh, I know at least for me, this sounds pretty good right about now. <laughs> um, so before we delve into mineral water advertising, uh, I just want to quickly take a look at some of the European establishments, specifically French spas, um, for a comparison of how they advertise their services. All right, so this may not seem like the most exciting piece of ephemera, but it is actually from one of the oldest water cure establishments in Europe and certainly one of the oldest in France. So Val-les-Bains in the province of Ardèche, uh, the story goes that in 1602, a fisherman whose name was either Pierre or Martin, apparently depending on who you ask, uh, discovered after a flood that drinking water that had been contaminated, quote unquote, by the spring at Val, uh, cured him of his kidney stones. So fast forward about 300 years, here we have this booklet, uh, which again kind of focuses a bit more on the health benefits than some of the American uh, ones did that we saw. Um, but even here, you know, they're noting that the rail station at Val is well organized, the countryside is picturesque and easily accessible. We've got the casino, the Grand Hotel, and just like in Hot Springs, South Dakota, the consumer is told that the hotel is of the first order, newly furnished, and has electric lights. Okay, so obviously here we have a kind of ritzier publication than that for Val with this lovely embossed cover and partial color printing on the interior. Um, we've also moved ahead in time, so this is from 1910. And over here we have these great photos of the casino and the promenade next to a very poetic description of why the location you know, makes it such a success. And then at the bottom, uh, we have a quote from the famous Professor Landuzzi, who was a neurologist from Reims. Uh, he writes that there is no village or town to disturb the beauty of Vital, adding that if I have noted this, it is not for the love of countryside, nor a love of the picturesque, but because this scenery is part of the combination therapies that are dear to me, and because those who want tranquility, calm, and rest will find them here and in the maximum comfort possible. So this assertion from Professor Landuzzi that the scenery is undisturbed by cities or towns and that this is all part of the cure makes sense. The wealthy are made to feel like they are doing themselves a real tangible benefit by going away for the season, even if they spend all their time in the casino and don't take the waters at all. And here we have a few more pages from the same Vital booklet. Uh, which I re reproduced to really give you a sense of the luxury these resorts in America were striving for when they thought of a European spa town. So for recreation, there's a casino, game halls, lecture halls, billiards rooms, a ballroom, a theater, tennis courts, concert halls, a golf course, riding stables, a racetrack, croquet and pétanque on the lawn, 
donkey rides through the countryside, a Catholic church, and an Anglican church, and to top it all off, we have les petits chevaux, which I can only mean, you know, understand to mean miniature horses. <laughs> uh, so you can see the ways in something originally intended to be a medical treatment morphs into this landscape of pleasure, uh, filled with so many activities that guests would no doubt feel obligated to, to spend weeks or even months there, and indeed, you can see that they're talking about the season of 1910, so not a week, not a month, but in fact, uh, May 25th to September 25th. Um, and this was spent hobnobbing with the other elites. And so if you're looking at this and you're not sure that it's really lux enough for you, they've actually listed all of the important people who are going to be spending the 1910 season at Vitao, which includes politicians, princes, dukes, and counts. We also have an amazing, uh, actually very international list of doctors who are going to be traveling to Vitao uh, on, during the 1910 season, coming from locales as diverse as Tunisia, Algeria, Brazil, Portugal, and Greece. So when taken as a whole, it's easy to see how the imaginary of the European spa town informed the American resorts advertising. All right, I'm running low on time here, so I'll go a little quicker. but. Um, so to take us to the end of this section, I have these postcards, which were printed as souvenirs of the water cure of Alvignac in southwestern France. Um, these come from the William Helfen collection of pharmaceutical ephemera at the AIHP. And here on the left, we have uh, these people taking the waters, and the caption reads, a cure at Alvignac, what delicious water. And then we have a second postcard demonstrating the famed effects of the Alvignac cure. <laughs> Uh, cure at Alvignac, what miraculous effects. So if you'll pardon a little bit of scatological humor, uh, the waters at Alvignac were, yes, famed for their laxative properties and were particularly frequented by those looking to lose weight quickly. So these postcards were originally part of a larger set of five that we only have these two in our collection and play off this idea to humorous effect. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and speed through to just talk a little bit about mineral waters and how they used these cure establishments to advertise their wares. Um, so here we have this image of the manufactory, you know, the bottling plant on the back of this advertisement for the Kronthal Spring. Um, and so, you know, that's somewhat typical in ephemera, but here, you know, we also have the mention of the casino and the baths and the boarding house, and you also have this, you know, situatedness in nature. So within the booklet, they're describing the environs of the spring, saying, when nature scattered its bounties over hill and dale, she certainly dealt with this, this lovely, unpretentious little spot of ground in no parsimonious manner. The romantic impressions produced by a wild mountain landscape. So it's all very florid, uh, very over the top. Um, and again, this is an advertisement for Americans to drink the water, not to go to the place. So there's no real need other than to create this kind of romantic terroir uh, to have such a florid description and image. All right, so similarly, uh, again, I know I'm running low on time, so uh, I'll just suffice it to say that these also bring in this kind of very similar lush imagery of the actual bottling or spring itself. Um, Hunyadi Janos, which is one of the most famous Hungarian uh, table waters as well. Um, and of course, I couldn't let it go by without Vichy water. Uh, here, they've taken actually kind of a different approach and are really focusing in on you know, what you could actually do if you were to go to Vichy. Um, and less on the kind of beautiful nature that we have in the others. In the 1940s, we have Saratoga Springs, which again uh, kind of takes another tact, which is, you know, I think again related to that moment in time where we're seeing much more of an emphasis on the actual geological nature of the spring and why that would give you health benefits as well as, um, you know, this real focus on the, uh, modern plant as sanitary and shining as a hospital. 
And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our, some of our cures from Wisconsin as the home state of our collection. Um, as you can see here, most of the water cures in Wisconsin were lithia water or mineral water containing lithium salts, which is a relatively rare subgenre of mineral springs. Um, I will skip over the really unhinged description of Waukesha water uh, in favor of, uh, of time, but I will just say that the Waukesha mineral water craze ended right around 1906 when the Pure Food and Drug Act made it illegal to make claims of unproven benefits on uh, food and drug labeling. So this led to a lot of artificial waters. Um, this slide mostly exists because I really wanted to show off this hairbreadth hairy cartoon, which I think is hilarious. Um, but the success of marketing mineral waters for health inspired a great deal of copycat innovation by pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly over here on the left, who tried to create artificial substitutes for the mineral waters being bottled at these different sources. And again, this became particularly relevant following the 1906 crackdown because this allowed manufacturers to really know what was actually going into each bottle and to test it for medicinal use. Um, so uh, when Harry's thrown down the well and Belinda smother me with onions runs over, uh, she throws her effervescent salts down the well, bringing Harry back up to the surface and saving his life from the dastardly Rudolph as always. All right, and that's pretty much it. This is just a quote from uh, Some Like It Hot. I was re-watching it the other week, and uh, I had never clocked the <laughs> uh, mineral baths there at the end. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much, and I will welcome any questions. Sometimes the advertisements uh, talk about the kind of water, what's in it, the lithium and so on. Um, many of them were sulfur water, and when I took the waters at Saratoga and emerged smelling really terrible, um, it, is it, in any of the advertisements, do they deal with that, with the smell? With the smell? I'm going to say no, probably because they didn't want to scare people off. <laughs> um, I mean, I think... Yeah, I hadn't. I don't think anything I looked at mentioned the smell. Um, I think they mostly talk about all the fresh air around the spring. <laughs> no comic postcards with them holding their nose. Oh, I, I wish. I mean, I'm sure those exist, but uh, maybe some of the other Alvignac ones. <laughs> How effective were the, uh, the, the waters for, for curing anything, um, the, the diseases you mentioned, including excessive masturbation? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'd have to do a little more research <laughs> onto that one. But um, I would say, in general, they tended to vary a lot in efficacy. Um, so some of them were, you know, basically just like drinking table water. It's not going to harm you, but it's also not going to do you a lot of good. Um, you know, the lithia ones I find very interesting. Uh, I do wonder if people felt like their mood was better, you know, <laughs> if they felt more stable after drinking the lithia water. Um, it is also hard to say because obviously a lot, you know, again, these are advertisements. They're not going to put in the, the, you know, testimonials from the people who are like, oh, this didn't work for me at all. Um, but I'm also skeptical to accept at face value the rest of the testimonials as well. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things, like the Buffalo Lithia Springs water in particular, they talked a lot about it curing kidney stones. And that seems to be kind of something that I see, you know, repeatedly in a lot of the literature. So I'm wondering if, you know, there's some kind of like base, uh, you know, acid balancing that happens when you take the waters that does actually help kidney stones but I am certainly not gonna get up here and tell you all to <laughs> go drink lithia water to cure your kidney stones by any means, so. 
Can I ask, was there, was there any um, literature on placebo effect of the water? Um, I mean, not in what I was looking at. Um, so again, like the, this was all pretty much, uh, you know, uh, from, like I said, 1880s to 1940s. There's like some later materials that we had, and obviously I referenced, you know, external sources, but I think it's probably really likely that there were placebo effects. Um, you know, I think a lot about that when I, you know, in history of pharmacy, there's a lot of, questionable cures that people are recommending. And I think, you know, probably some of the actual cures were this idea that, you know, I think I'm being healed and therefore I am. Thank you. Hi, Hannah. Um, last night we met and um, you told me what you did and I went back to my room last night. I brought some ephemera with me and I found a letter that was written from Warm Springs, mm -hmm. a handwritten letter. Cool. So I'll show that to you later today, but yeah, I definitely. had held on to it for such a long time, and I never thought I would ever meet anyone, but that's why, <laughs> I'm here for. That's why this conference is great. <laughs> um, thanks so much. I have, my question is about the Dakotas, the, the one in the resort in the Dakotas. Um, mm. Is there a link between the divorce, because you could, you could get an early divorce in the Dakotas, and it would certainly be the same demographic? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the spa, a lot of the resorts were actually kind of almost marketed as these singles resorts. So I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of played into that as well. Um, but, you know, the idea was that you had to be kind of of a certain income to go to these places. If you're young, there's all these leisure activities and, you know, kind of a, there's a lot of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You can, you know, meet somebody special if you go and, you know, young ladies come with your families and, you know, you'll find a husband. Um, but yeah, no, that's an interesting question because I... You know, I know they would have like those hotels where like all the women would come to get a divorce and kind of see see each other and um, uh, so yeah, it, it wasn't something that came up, but that's that's a really interesting kind of connection between those two things. Hi, um, I knew Bill Helfen really well, um, and you have to remember that his exhibition on his subject pharmacy was called Quack Quack. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Just saying. Hi, thanks so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, at one point, I think you might have been talking about Saratoga Springs, and you said that these documents were sent to the Institute by the SPA. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit about how and when the, uh, the School of Pharmacy came to have this ephemera archive. Uh, sure. So um, the kind of base collection is called the uh, Kremers Reference Files, um, and that is in reference to Edward Kremers, who was the second director of the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy uh, from 1893 to 1931. Um, and he basically was trying to write the kind of comprehensive textbook on the history of pharmacy, and so started collecting all these materials in order to um, support his research. Uh, he then started working with this man, George Erdong, um, who actually came to the US as a Jewish refugee during World War II, um, but he was someone that Kremers had previously known, and he kind of took over when Kremers died and finished the textbook. So that is now known as Kremers and Erdong's History of Pharmacy, which is kind of the canonical History of Pharmacy textbook. Um, and so they were pretty avid in collecting. So they would write away to all different kinds of organizations and institutions and say, you know, can you send me anything you have? Um, and that impetus really lasted until about the 1950s, I would say. Um, George Erdong actually had Parkinson's, so then he kind of reached a point where that was a lot more difficult for him to kind of be working actively. Um, and then the collecting started to become more donations or what, whoever was the head of the institute kind of going out, whatever they were able to collect. Um, but yeah, definitely during this period of time, there was a lot of interconnectedness with kind of all these different medical establishments. Thank you, Hannah. Um, you showed a number of images of bottled waters from Europe that were brought 
you know, imported to America um, from, from European spas, and so many of the American spas were developed on a European model. Do you have any evidence of American water being bottled and sent to hmm. Europe or overseas? That's interesting. So, I mean, not in our collection, um, because obviously it was kind of everything coming to Wisconsin. Um, but I, I feel like the, probably the only one would have been Saratoga water that I would imagine. Um, I can't really think of another big name that was bottling that would have sent overseas. Um, but that's actually, a, that, yeah, that's a good question. I feel like they don't, there's not the same kind of relationship of, you know, fantasizing about the European spa town and, you know, there's so much history. You know, you have Baden-Baden and Bath and spa in Belgium um, that I think there was a lot more of America looking to Europe than there was maybe Europe looking to America. But that would, yeah, that would be interesting to... Yes, that's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, Western American fantasy. Yeah, definitely. Can you remark on the relationship between uh, Water Cure and David Ruggles? Uh, I don't know that much, actually. Um, do you yes. want to comment? <laughs> I do. Um, uh, also curious to know about what you um, have gleaned from the relationship between social reform movements uh, and and water cure. Sure. So um, I so like I said, I went to the um, here. I can go back. Um, so I uh, had to go to Ebling Library at um, UW Madison. Had to uh, to do research for this um, because our materials don't go that far back. Um, but the uh, the water cure, the reform movement water cure part is so deeply fascinating to me, and I I could have done a whole presentation just on that. But you know, I wanted to really stay grounded in our collections at the AIHP. Um, but so uh, one, of the, one of my favorite parts of the Water Cure Journal is they had a matrimonial section. And so single people, men and women, who were looking to get married to another reformer would write into the Water Cure Journal this whole description of themselves and then uh, place the ad and say, you know, you can contact the editors, uh, Fowler and Wells, to connect you with me if you think you would want to be my wife in Kansas or whatever. Um, and so uh, you have this really kind of interesting piece where you get these guys saying, you know, I want a woman with a natural waist. So like if you wear a corset, don't even bother, you know. <laughs> and uh, you have ads for like, let's make a vegetarian community in Kansas. Who's with me? Write me here. Um, you know, it's this fascinating uh, kind of moment in time. Um, you also have, you know, people would write in and say, you know, I have a sore toe, what should I do? And they would be like, well, just wrap it in a bandage with some water and you'll be fine. Or, you know, I have this ailment or my son is, you know, wetting the bed, what do I do? And, you know, the answer is always, of course, water. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so you kind of see this really interconnectedness. You know, you also have all the utopian movements and, you know, that plays in with a lot of the water cure um, journal establishments, et cetera. Um, I could go on and on, but I will, <laughs> I will leave it there. I will say um, one thing that I did want to put up for all the ephemeris is the uh, new patent medicine advertisement. So someone basically took a, a patent medicine poem that was being used at the time and replaced all the cures with cold water. So, you know, you've got, does a ringworm show its head? Cold water, sure, will kill it dead. <laughs> Primarily, <clears throat> primarily eastern uh, areas. I wonder if you do much. With, if there's much in the collection with uh, Arizona in the Southwest, uh, Buckhorn Mineral Baths, uh, Castle Hot Springs, the uh, uh, sort of southwestern uh, 
outside of that at all? Yeah, no, there's a, we don't have pretty much anything from kind of west of Colorado, South Dakota. Um, you know, again, I think uh, part of this is going to be, I mean, it's it's a it's a really fascinating collection because part of it is obviously going to be like, where did these people actually go? You know, where did Edward Kramers actually go to, you know, Hot Springs, South Dakota, and that's how he had this. Did he know someone who went there and they gave him this advertisement? Um, but so I'm from Washington State, and I was kind of interested to see more West Coast um, hot springs mention. But uh, you know, it was just a very selective, kind of odd, oddly selective uh, group of materials. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.